Hi everybody and welcome to the weekly wrap for October 23rd, 2020. My name is Marianne Simpson from Apex Media. And I'm Seth Miller from Paxx.Aero. Guess what Seth, today is our 25th episode. No way! Yes way! Absolutely. Um, so I just want to take a minute to thank our wonderful sponsor West Entertainment for supporting the show and everybody who watches it, our uh, modest but very loyal following for the series. Thank you guys for watching. Um, anybody who hasn't liked and shared the show already or subscribed to the channel, please do that. Um, and we really do appreciate all of your support. So thank you. Indeed, very much appreciated. Uh, diving into the news this week, the first story we've got, unfortunately, is a bit of bad news. Uh, Cathay Dragon has suspended operations immediately, part of a restructuring of the parent Cathay Pacific group. And it's, I don't want to say too surprising, but also obviously not good news um, as part of the deal. Um, I think about 5,600 additional employees are going to be laid off. So uh, really unfortunate, but uh, here's where we are. Yeah, that's right. It's really unfortunate. Um, you know, I think we, we get a little bit disheartened every time we hear about these things happening. But also, I think on a positive note, it's nice to know that the airlines are restructuring and looking at um, how the business can be operational and, and continue to be operational for the future. Uh, so Cathay Pacific did receive a $5 billion U.S. Uh, rescue package from the government of Hong Kong this summer because at the time they were bleeding between uh, 200 and 250 million, or is it billion? 250 million U.S. dollars per month, which is a substantial amount of money um, now due to the restructure, unfortunately letting people go and getting rid of the Cathay Dragon brand. They will be losing about 80 million a month less. Yeah, so... Definitely helping to reduce that uh, cash hemorrhaging, but still not enough. There's going to have to be a lot that changes. Uh, the mainland China market, which is a huge thing for uh, Cathay, has sort of evaporated and was a big part of the Cathay Dragon uh, operation. About half of its uh, destinations were there at one point. Um, the routes will mostly be kept alive either through the Hong Kong Express low-cost carrier arm or through Cathay Pacific, the parent operation. So... Uh, definitely fewer frequencies, fewer lower total capacity, but not completely exiting those markets. Um, and slightly more positive news, we've got some interesting updates on testing coming from airports in the EU. Yeah, that's right, Seth. So from the 26th of October, which is the Monday after this video comes out, uh, anybody departing from or arriving into Paris Charles de Gaulle or Orly Airport um, will be required to do what they call a rapid antigen test. This is a nasal swab. Um, and so for departing passengers, if they test negative, they will be allowed to uh, get on the plane and fly to where they want to go. Now, whether or not the destination country accepts the result of this test is, um, is another question uh, entirely. And then for people inbound into Paris, I imagine that a negative test will allow them to get back on with their life, whereas a positive test would require them to self-isolate. Self Indeed. And in the UK, a little bit of a similar story at Heathrow, uh, where Collinson and Swissport have established a process for a similar test. Uh, this is, the big difference on this one is only for two destinations or two areas, Hong Kong and Italy. And uh, the passenger has to pay for it because it's considered a sort of value-add service as opposed to the French version, which is much more about a public health situation. Well, uh, let's go with this is all I can say. I'm really excited to see airports testing out um, these testing regimes, and I hope that it means we can all start uh, flying and traveling around a little bit sooner. Uh, moving along, really big news this week in the in-flight uh, connectivity world. We've got Inmarsat and Hughes Network Systems, big uh, powerhouse slugger players, especially in uh, the North American space, have joined forces um, to combine Hughes Jupiter satellite network together with Inmarsat GX to provide really unrivaled coverage in the region. And here to tell us more about that, we've got Inmarsat Aviation President Philip Baum. Philip, welcome to the show. Hi, Seth. Hi, Marianne. It's, it's great to be with you. Phil, tell us what the uh, Inmarsat GX Plus product is all about. GX Plus North America is a seamless combination of the two premium uh, satellite networks for aviation connectivity. That's a description, I guess, at a very basic level. But what it really is, is a unique, superior and ready solution for North American airlines, which will allow them to 
to unlock their ambition and accelerate their strategies uh, with their passengers for next generation connectivity. This is a big move bringing partners into the Inmarsat ecosystem. How challenging is that to implement? It's actually relatively straightforward to integrate for, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, because we've got two extremely well-proven, demonstrated, and fully operational networks that we're, that we're basing this system on. Uh, secondly, the solution is really quite simple technologically. And, and finally, uh, what makes it even more straightforward is the wealth of experience with our partners, whether that's Hughes on the network side, uh, whether it's ThinkCom for the terminal, or our other partners, Contron uh, and GDC. So Phil, this move is really targeting US-based carriers, um, but you know, aircraft really stay in one airspace for too long. So how is the GX Plus customer going to be able to avail themselves of uh, these services when they fly further afield? So what this product, what GX Plus North America is, it's really a seamless combination uh, of the two premium networks. On the one hand, you have the Jupiter network over North America, and on the other hand, you have uh, GX, which is, uh, which as you know, is, is, is global coverage. And what this product does, it brings them together, and it brings them together with a seamless uh, switching system, which is based on board uh, on the aircraft, and which will allow the aircraft, as it's flying from one zone to another, to be able to switch from one network other. This allows North American Airlines to have the benefit of the extremely deep capacity that the Jupiter network provides in North America, together with the consistent and reliable service that GX brings globally. So an aircraft will be able to fly anywhere, whether it's in North American airspace or globally, and have a consistent, reliable, extremely high quality, industry leading level of service. You know, usually in this industry, we hear about an announcement and then it's twiddling our thumbs for months, if not years, waiting for it to actually be something that's delivered and ready to go. Uh, you're saying this is ready to sell now. How do you get there so quickly? Well, there, there are a number of differences uh, between this product and maybe some of the other products that have been introduced over the years into this market. First of all, this is a, uh, we've been working on this for quite some time, bringing it to a, a stage of maturity, which we believe is now ready, uh, ready to go live. Secondly, it's, it's based on extremely well-established uh, and well-controlled and demonstrated technologies, both on the Hughes side and on the Inmarsat side. It's relatively straightforward technologically. It's really just a switch that enables us to roam from one network to the other. And the, uh, the partner for portfolio that we have working, on, working with us has such a wealth of experience that this, uh, the, the, technologically, the, the level of technological maturity is really very high. So we're extremely confident that uh, this solution can be delivered uh, uh, towards the end of 2021 and we are already active in the market selling it today. All right, and Phil, um, you guys are describing this deal as something really different to collaborations that you've done in the past. Uh, what makes this arrangement so special? One of, the, one of the key differentiators of this strategic collaboration between Inmarsat and Hughes is the strength of our combined network. So today, together, we have seven satellites in orbit. And over the next four years, we'll bring that up to 15. Uh, it will be very difficult for any of our competitors uh, to bring anything like that firepower to bear in the market. And that brings capacity, but even more importantly, it brings the resilience and the redundancy that we'll be able to deliver that probably no one else will be. Yeah, some really exciting stuff here. I can't wait to see GX Plus flying, you know, anything that gets more and faster uh, capacity onto airplanes for internet service is just hugely exciting to me, uh, which is also a great segue into our next topic. Uh, the Seamless Air Alliance has issued its Seamless Release 2.0, which is the next round of specifications and guidelines for how to better make uh, the hardware on board available and more uh, interoperable. 
Yeah, exactly. So the Seamless Air Alliance is a not-for-profit group that was formed a few years ago back in the industry, and it comprises a number of ground-based telecom operators, um, airframers, and then some of the traditional players in in-flight connectivity. And they basically have a goal of creating this seamless, <laughs> seamless air uh, connectivity experience. So basically, this SR2 provides specific definitions for each network component in the in-flight entertainment uh, system. Yeah, and those definitions are really important. The idea here is that rather than only buying, you know, a suite of components from a single vendor, uh, the airlines can work to, uh, can sort of pick best of breed options from different vendors uh, to complete the sort of ecosystem on board their airplanes. And it's it's sort of a mix and match approach. It lets them, uh, you know, it lets them when something new comes out, they can easily swap an updated component in without having to worry about. Does it go, is it going to play nice with all the other things? Now, that's assuming they all work with this, what they're calling the open IFC standard. Um, but yeah, it really should help uh, improve the sort of performance and reliability and also sort of bring down costs for all the onboard hardware because as long as the manufacturers are making them to the spec, they'll be sort of accepted by any of the partners, any of the vendors, any of the airlines. So there should be some volume opportunities there as well. Yeah, I think this sounds great. I actually interviewed uh, Jack Mandela um, who is the CEO of the Seamless Air Alliance a couple years ago uh, when they first launched. And he said that basically a lot of airlines are kind of, they're, they're reluctant to make decisions on IFE systems because they know how difficult, or IFC systems rather, because they know how difficult it is to make a change. If another competitor leapfrogs the technology or, you know, it's just not working anymore for their fleet, it's really difficult to then run a new system through that. You have to take all the hardware off and put all new hardware on. So um, this should, it should help airlines be able to upgrade and mix and match much better, like you said. Yeah, absolutely. And switching from in-flight connectivity to my other sort of passion of loyalty programs, uh, Spirit Airlines announced this week they're relaunching their Free Spirit program. And this is a much, much more mature program than the original one. And really, it's sort of a huge step change to line up the loyalty program much more closely to how the airline operates. Yeah, it's a revenue-based earning system, which basically um, is, is I guess, par for the course for an ultra-low-cost carrier because most of their revenue is dependent on ancillary um, sales. Uh, but I think it's great. You earn double the points for ancillary products. So if you're like me and you travel heavy and you need that extra bag, you're going to benefit from that in the long run. So I like, I like the uh, basis of this one. Yeah, you know, that's one of the big differences in the new program. There's also the idea of status tiers, uh, which are typically focused more on business travelers, but they've got a gold, you know, silver and gold status tiers. Uh, they're based on spend, not surprisingly. So $2,000 worth of airline spend gets you gold, silver, uh, 5000 gets you gold. You can also earn credits towards status with their credit card. Uh, so again, tying into the co-brand marketing and sort of that low-cost carrier approach. Um, but, you know, the chief commercial officer, Matt Klein, sort of described the status program uh, to me earlier this week and said, you know, if they can create the higher engagement with the gold member, they're going to see more of that overall spend. And gold status gets you a lot of waivers from fees. You get free seat assignment. You get free bags. You get free early boarding. You get free carry-on bag and check bag. All those things come with it. But, you know, so it's giving a lot of things away. But as he, he uh, continued... You know, it all works together with revenue management. The overall spend validates the status. And so it's, it's a really interesting approach to combining loyalty and the airline sort of underlying operations together to drive that total dollar number. Great. Cool. Well, uh, you know, I would say I look forward to that, but I've never actually flown Spirit. Um, I'm kind of stuck in the UK right now, so it might be a while before I get to try that one out. Um, anyway, let's move along to the final thought of the day today. I was super happy to read this news that the A380 shower is back. Yay! Uh, another thing that I'll probably never use in my lifetime. Um, but it, it's just a really amazing thing. I remember when it came out, how much hype there was all around it. Uh, it was, you know, the, the Emirates was the first airline to bring a shower to the sky and they did it in such a way that it wasn't just like a little shower pod. It was this whole luxurious suite. The thing has heated floors. Um, you know, it's, it's really, uh, it's quite swish. Um, uh, what, what else? I was so, you're looking at some, uh, footage right now of the, um, A380 shower suite and, um, you can't hear the audio on this, but there's some audio by Deal, who were the company who designed it and built them all. Um, and they were saying they take about 8,000, it took 8,000 hours to design it and they took 2,500 hours each to make by 12 
um, engineers in the deal facility. So I just think it's a cool piece of engineering and I'm, I'm glad to hear that people can, can enjoy it again. Yeah, it, it is a very nice experience if you ever get the, the opportunity. I highly recommend it. Um, be, beyond that, you know, this is part of Emirates restoring some of its sort of pre-world uh, benefits and features and uh, opportunities on board. So things are coming back a little bit is really uh, the sort of upshot of this and the takeaway, I think. That's right. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. We're out of time for today. Make sure you uh, hit like and subscribe. Uh, visit apex.aero and paxx.aero for all your um, for all your aviation news needs, and we'll catch you next time. Take care.